Hello and welcome to the first Wonky Cast of 2016. Uh, apologies, it's been a while since we did the last show, so we'll uh, kind of we'll uh, say this one's season two, and uh, we'll take it from here. So uh, this week's show is a panel that we recorded at uh, the last MCM with uh, several members of the Game of Thrones cast. So uh, hope you enjoy that. Keep an eye out on the website. We've got uh, all sorts of new casts and uh, video interviews and all sorts going out, and as well some let's plays that I've been recording for The Walking Dead. So check those out on the website and the YouTube channel. Also check out the events section of the website. We've put in all the dates of the uh, conventions and events that we're likely to be attending this year. So if you want to catch up with any of us from uh, the Monkey Cast or Nerd vs World, then give us a shout and uh, come and see us at one of the events. Until then, enjoy. Have a host? Yes. yes we do, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Right. Hi, I'm Martin from Bad Wolf. I just want to know how you enjoyed the phone so far today. I, I had an absolute ball. Uh, every time I go to one of these events, you get a chance to meet the fans, you get a chance to talk to the show, uh, talk about the show with the fans. It's just fantastic. I mean, I'm a fan of the show myself, um, but to meet such a passionate, wonderful, interested and interesting group, it's a real pleasure for me. I think sometimes, you know, when you're kind of doing what you do and you think, well, is that OK? And then you come here and you get feedback from people who absolutely live, breathe and eat Westeros. And you think, yeah, did OK. I just love these events. And today has been an absolute ball. Can't really add in to that. I think uh, BD here is, uh, sorry, I call him BD because we're both Ian and it gets confusing otherwise. Uh, so I think BD <laughs> here has covered uh, pretty well every base there. Um, I mean, the thing that you're very much aware of is that they know far more about the show than you do. Yeah. You know, it's one of the we, things about these, you get put to test, don't you? You yeah. get tested every time. I get yeah. nervous when fans approach almost, what do they know? What do they know? <laughs> they know so much, and what they don't know, they sort of like, you know, they're, they're constantly in touch with each other, and they've got all sorts of theories about it, and well, half the time we, we don't know in the same way. And plus, you know, now you get the scripts, and we only get the scripts that we're in. It used to be we were able to see everything, but they've got so sort of like, you know, nervous about letting stuff out. You only see the scripts that you're in, so you don't necessarily know everything that's going on. And when you're asked for your theories, you sort of think, well, what do I know, you know? It's much more effective. It means that when you say, I don't know, you really don't know. So <laughs> it works quite well. And it's a situation where it's okay to say, I don't know, you know. But a lot of fun, basically. Yeah, a lot of fun, <laughs> a lot of fun. Hi, it's uh, Kareem from Metro. Um, Ian, Ian B. Um, so in a series that doesn't pull its punches when it comes to violence, your character met a specially bloody end. And I was just wondering if you could talk us through what it was like filming that scene and like how hard did you and Maisie Williams have to work to like really do it justice? Well, from the very beginning, you know, I figured that Marilyn was going to bite the dust somewhere. And David and Dan, they're pretty classy guys. They phoned me to tell me, Marilyn Morgulis, that's your lot, chum. But they said that you'd see a really nasty side of the character and I'd have a great death. I thought I was going to get to kill somebody popular. I thought, you know, I was going to get to kill Braun or something. And I got the script and I'm reading it and I'm going, oh my God. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. It was awful. I mean, I have three kids at home. If somebody touched one of my children, let me tell you something, it would take that person a lot longer to die than Merrin. <laughs> really. So, yeah, they were extraordinarily upsetting scenes to do. And the biggest challenge of my acting career, bar none. Uh, in a way, I was so grateful to the boys for giving me this, you know, giving me this opportunity. Because it's what an actor lives for, to get scenes like this. The actual end, uh, when Maisie and I were filming, uh, Maisie is just an incredible young actress, absolutely incredible, one of the most stunning young actresses I've ever seen. Uh, she's absolutely wonderful. Uh, we decided, her and I, very, very early, that in this particular scene, we had to go for it, and we went for it. 
no pun and I had complete trust in her she had complete trust in me it was technically very difficult as well because the eyes we, f we filmed that last scene on my last day unusually enough and it was all filmed in order so the last take was the last take for me but uh, very early on in the day my eyes went down so I, have to, I had to have prosthetics and for the last seven or eight hours on set I was completely blind <laughs> which was really weird blood tubes coming up blood going down my nose it was just technically you know it was very difficult <laughs> being blind actually really helped me show a vulnerability to that character at that moment in time so it actually helped but it was very very difficult and I just thank whatever gods are up there that I had Maisie to do it with because she is stunning wonderful I mean you, you said you haven't killed anyone popular I mean without you say anything that might give away future plot lines? Did Meryl kill Syria? I'm sorry, uh, calling Syria popular. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he may be popular with the fans, but I think Meryl was completely you misunderstood. Know what? I'm going to message Miltos right now and tell him you <laughs> yeah, said that. Tell the water dancing little <laughs> git I said hello. Uh, no, I mean uh, yes. I'm pretty popular, certain. Right? I'm pretty certain Syria went at that point. I, <laughs> I would be astonished if we saw Syria again before the final curtain. I don't think Meryn would have left Serio alive. If, as some fans believe, uh, Serio became Meryn, well, surely that would have been revealed yeah. whenever Meryn died. Surely then he would have appeared, which would have actually been really weird, see, if Arya saying she just killed Serio. But uh, no, Serio, I believe Meryn killed him. Meryn did not disobey Cersei, yeah. ever. It was the only redeeming feature I ever found in the character, his fierce loyalty to Cersei Lannister. The only one. Neela <laughs> um, from the Express Online. For all of you, what was the Sorry, motion? Second, just so we can recap the recording. Uh, Neela from the Express Online. Um, what was the most challenging scene for all of you to film in season five? Well, in my own case, in season five, I guess, you know, it has to be the fight. Um, but, um, you know, boys. Adrenaline, you know, you kind of just love so it. You know what I mean? You know, you just you just get off on it. So although it was challenging, it was actually kind of exciting, you know. Uh, but that that scene was not that difficult in that all of the harpies, every single one of them, were stuntmen. So they all know what they're supposed to be doing, and. Uh, I work through it first of all with the stunt coordinator and then I work with the guys so I mean I know that everybody around me is there to kind of like you know do what we're meant to do and with a bit of luck if I know my routines and I follow their lead I should be safe and they should be safe which is probably more to the point. I thought you did very well for I a man your were, age. You were dashing man. You came, <laughs> the moment you stepped into that room the sword came out with such grace. Well, I do well, have to great. say, I was, I was chuffed with the fact that I did the whole thing myself, because sometimes people ask you, you know, did you have a stuntman stand in? And uh, I didn't, and I wouldn't have wanted it, and nor would they have wanted it, if at all possible, you know. But, uh, I mean, one of the big issues, obviously, with fights, especially with actors, is because your adrenaline does get going, is that you lose the plot. You know, and before <laughs> you know it, you've hit somebody, and you've hit them harder than you meant to, and it's like, oh, geez, you know, but, you know, fortunately, nobody died, so we were fine. I mean, I would say that for me, that the the real scene that gave me a lot to uh, a lot to really think about, both before and after, was actually the first scene of my character's return in season five, when Lancel came back. It's a it was a really weird season in a lot of ways for my character. It was a really um, uh, sort of an extraordinary um, experience and sort of um, story to tell because I think when he returned, this figure that stands before Cersei is so kind of. Um, so clearly unlike anything we've ever seen. But what was amazing for me to, about the character Dari was that the rate at which Lancel Lannister appears in the first episode and goes from being someone who you could easily com confuse with being a kind of namaste shanti sort of uh, member of a really fairly pacifistic sort of um, monastery to really actually being someone in the second scene becoming someone who is incredibly militant and is actually hiding underneath this, as, in, as was, it was in the first scene, this kind of lucid totally disconnected, sort of almost come out of like a, a real trauma, lip quivering from the fact that he's actually really trying at the start to almost convince himself that he's under control and he is not under control. He's trying desperately to remain under control. 
And then the way that he finds that control is through violence and through this faith and through commitment. And I don't want to be too, too intense about it, but given current affairs, the fact that we were filming this, this, this series whilst current foreign affairs are going on was even more harrowing because it was, I, I couldn't start, go, start going, gosh, it feels as though this, the timing of this is so terrifyingly um, inappropriate and appropriate. So it, the first scene for me was a, was a, was a big deal, I felt, because I, 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 got, I got there that day, did my, uh, my best to kind of bring that across, and for the rest of the season, I had to move very quickly, and in some ways non-sequentially to go from disconnected to actually really quite violent to really damaged and broken and, um, and horrible. And, um, I know, I know exactly what um, what Ian means about when it comes to the to the adrenaline rush of getting in a fight. Because when I had to arrest the High Septon in my second scene, bursting into that brothel with Paul Paul um, uh, Paul Paul Bentley, Bentley, I had my my nails were about as long as this microphone because I'd been growing them for the show because he's so feral. I went and I picked him up and I didn't realise because I had I was in such in the zone that. I had wolverined his ribs as I was reaching underneath him, and he didn't even notice either. And suddenly we just went, "What, what is that, Paul? What's, what is that on your on your rib?" And I just and I I I cut, I cut him up basically by accident. So yes, I did make the mistake of going a bit too uh, accidentally too far with that. But he was naked. He was naked as the day he was born, and um, I felt very very uh, very apologetic for that. So, Can't yes. wait to work for you again. Nah, I know, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> really yeah. looking forward really to it. Put, put me in an action film, see what happens. <laughs> anyway, it was a lot of fun. For me, I mean, uh, quite clear, it was episode 10. Um, it was the most horrific two days. I have three children at home. The fact that the casting in Game of Thrones is so perfect, they couldn't have found three more beautiful angels to beat than the three they found. And the young actresses that were involved, uh, Hattie, uh, Isabel and Bella, were absolutely fantastic. Instinctively, they were wonderful young actresses. They made that scene. Because if they hadn't reacted the way they did, it wouldn't have worked. They were fantastic. What made it worse was that, you know, you can't stay in character. So as soon as he yelled, cut, I had to come out and be in again. I couldn't stay in character. But it was the most upset I think I've ever been, ever, in front of a camera, because there were times when I just said, like, I'm just going to the bathroom, I'm going to the bathroom, and I burst into tears. Now, I will promise you when I say that stick did not touch those children once, and I will promise you when I say those kids had a great day, their parents were there, the Game of Thrones set is a very protected and very protective set. You know, we, everybody is really carefully looked after. Um, but it was horrible. To, to act the role of a man who took pleasure in doing that. It was the most upsetting scene I've ever done. And honestly, I'm really genuinely very proud of everybody involved in that scene that we pulled it off. Uh, everybody who was in that scene, we, we pulled it off and I was really pleased about that. We don't do short questions here. <laughs> <laughs> Ask an actor to talk about himself? Yeah. Oh, my God. Well. <laughs> I question to Ian N. Um, I mean, Sir Barristan is still alive in the next book. Now, when you saw the script for season five, how did you feel when you saw that, you know, you met that end? Truthfully, miffed. <laughs> in fact, I knew before I even saw the script because I got the schedule. And I, in a way, unfortunately, I'd read the books. So I had expectations for season five, and as soon as I got the schedule, I thought, well, there's something up here, because I thought I'd be doing more weeks, and in fact, I was doing less than normal. So immediately, I mean, I thought, well, they must be writing me out. And I asked the line producer for confirmation, and he said, basically, above my pay grade, you know. <laughs> so uh, I then uh, said, well, get the boys to give me a ring. Well, I got the script first. And then it was evidenced in the script. And then eventually the boys gave me a ring. If I'm honest, I was a bit dischuffed by that because I felt that I should have known. It wouldn't have made any difference, but I felt it was a matter of just courtesy. I should have known beforehand, you know. Um, and I was disappointed because I was enjoying playing the part. I was looking forward to actually getting more meat in the part. And I had 
dared to presume that I'd at least go into season six and who knows further. But, uh, you know... See, there was your big mistake I right there. Never presume in Game of Thrones. Uh, yes. I, Ever. I obviously shouldn't have dared to presume, and uh, as my colleague here on the right will no doubt, uh, well, has, <laughs> has already agreed, you know. But, you know, so be it. The, 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 the deed is done, and I'm on to other things, and that's that. But I do miss it. You might, you I might come happily, back. I would happily have stayed on, you know. You might come back as a white walker, which is more than I can do because I have no eyes left. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know I'm a white walker. No, if, I, if I came back as a white walker, my, my character would probably have more soul if he did. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's it. Hi, yes, one for Eugene. Um, as your character was kind of fairly responsible for the downfall of Cersei in the last season, are, are you expecting some harsh retribution for your character next season when she comes back? <laughs> Um, again, as, as um, Ian Beattie, I think uh, his name is, um, has, uh, has said, um, I have no particular expectations. I think it's very important not to have expectations. Um, I, do, I, do, I do feel instinctively that the faith militant still definitely has a bone to pick. It's a, it, by its very nature, it wants to kind of purge what is basically unpurgeable. So, I, and I think that in that sense, Thursday definitely falls into the crosshairs pretty significantly. Um, uh, I don't know much about the retribution side of it, but I do think that... Um, that certainly the the battle that has really begun the war really that has really begun between the the crown and the faith is um, is is well is pretty is one, pro probably the, one of the most major political events that's going on in King's Landing at the moment and that is to say that there is something that must be continued in that storyline um, there is something that must be must be seen in some way and um, for the sake of my character and having a job I hope the faith comes out on top quite frankly <laughs> and the whole power the whole system crumbles before us and we replace the red keep with a uh, uh, another sept that would be my uh, that would be my greatest desire <laughs> well, I may be beyond uh, redemption, but I can't possibly endorse that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we had you. I think <laughs> you've, I think you've pissed off Cersei Lannister. I think you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Just personally speaking, yeah. I'm speaking as a fan now, with absolutely no knowledge or input. Um, yeah, well, no, I would. No, I mean, let's get up be, on him. No, we, we're yeah, right no. Of it. He should be. Yeah, out of it, we're know. out of a job. We're unemployed. He's <laughs> not going. You know, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would be. I mean, I. Squad. But it is a, it's one of those battle royale situations that you're building up yeah. to, you know. And I mean, when you, the great thing about having this situation is that when you have got a character with such history of negligence and suffering as Cersei Lannister, and you have this new character of Jonathan in the, in the flesh of Jonathan Price as the High, high Sparrow, um, I mean, Jonathan Price has brought something to the character which is so perfect, and for me was actually really quite inspiring to see, which is the ability um, to be totally reasonable, totally and utterly reasonable and make total sense and be completely convincing in his political and social arguments, which is, you don't seem to quite, as he, as he says with um, the, uh, the Queen of Thorns, you don't seem to quite understand. You, you're not quite able to really understand the simplicity of, what, of what's happening here. I serve the gods, and the gods demand justice. And it is a perfectly apt and, and appropriate line for the simplistic nature of their ideology but he will never ever give you reason to suspect that he's actually orchestrating militant movements so it's uh it's a great battle royale in that sense hi ben Shai is from audible um game of thrones has never been afraid to to kill off well pretty much anyone main characters lesser characters whoever i mean the fact that two of the three panel members are now dead i think speaks volumes um when it comes to the new series and beyond, we kind of caught up with the books, so no one can really second guess where their characters are going to be. Does that mean that everyone's walking around on eggshells now, sucking up to producers, <laughs> making extra <laughs> people, that kind of thing? What will the atmosphere be like? I, I don't know, because I'm not there. Uh, you don't know, because uh, no, you're not no, there. No, but I, I would suspect that... Uh, most actors will be just kind of like putting a brave front on it and, and doing what they do, and nobody would be sucking up for fear that it looks like that. Yeah, absolutely. I think they'll just be getting on with their thing, and suddenly, sorry, you're gone. I, mean, I, 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 do, I, I do believe that, you know, uh, George, the genius, Mr. Martin, who created this incredible world, I do believe him and David and Dan would speak on a regular basis. I, I'm certain of that. They couldn't not... Uh, so, uh, I mean, for example, I get the feeling 
that when book six comes out, and this is what for me is so exciting. Uh, this is the first season, season six, the, the one they're making at the moment. This is the first season where there is no guide whatsoever. Even when season five <laughs> came out, A Dance with Dragons was out and, you know, storylines were known. Uh, this is the first season where everybody is completely in the dark. As I say, I'm sure David and Dan and George know that perfectly well. But I, for one, as a fan of the show, I'm extraordinarily excited because I have no idea. Mm. I I like that. I mm -hmm. don't actually like spoilers. I don't want the surprise to be spoiled. I don't want my Christmas presents on Christmas Eve. You know, I really, I'm really excited for. Look, I'm really looking forward to season six. Completely in the dark, and anything could happen. I think he's absolutely right. I think one of the great, uh, one of the lucky things about about the fact that we've now gone into uncharted territory is the fact that there is actually something worse than having an unpleasant surprise, such as your character dying fall before you. And that surprise is believing very firmly, based on the books, that you were good for the next season, and then actually finding out that they changed the storyline and that you're done. That's not a nice way to discover that, to discover your situation. We've now gone into territory where the storyline is liberated of expectation in terms of the actors that are involved. And it means basically that the storyline is in the hands of people who are trying to, to make it loyal to the show, make it loyal to the books, but also <coughs> maximise its enjoyment and maximise their own interpretation of what will make it better. So that means that for us actors, we've, I think that it gives you a sense of kind of just sully forth, sully forth and whatever happens, happens. No one is... Jack, Dan, and David will certainly talk with George, but there's no, there's no precursor that is sort of move, that, is, that is puppeteering what we're going to do in the show anymore. It's, it's, in, our, it's in our hands. Um, and that's a, that's a nice feeling to have. That's a very nice feeling to have. Yeah, well, well I mean, what is interesting is that uh, if the rumour is true, and I think it is, ideally, Series 6 and Book 6 will come out at the same time, more or less. Sometime in the spring, Book 6 is apparently going to be published. And it would be fascinating, because it's a completely open question. Will book six actually try and square the circle and, and, and show how whatever deviation there's been, this is how the, these storylines are coming together? Mm. Or have they actually agreed, listen, your agenda is different from mine. You follow your journey, I'll follow mine. And we actually get two separate uh, you know, res resolutions of this journey so far. And it's quite legitimate and quite possible that it will be the second, because the demands of book writing are completely different from the demands of television. Mm. And um, I think some of the things that have happened TV-wise have been because the boys have now created for themselves an expectation that they must have shock value in each and every episode. Mm -hmm. So somehow or another, they've got to do that. The book doesn't have those uh, pressures on it in the same way, and it may well be that, as I say, they'll just do different journeys, and in some ways that'll be fascinating, you know, just, oh, so you've done this and we've done that. And, and I think we, we would even take pleasure in that, you know, we yeah. would see yeah. our characters going in directions that we didn't go in the show, and therefore you are suddenly kind of, ooh, you know, somehow you're, you're still kind of going in, that, in, a, in a way. I, I felt that way with Lancel when I got the story. I suddenly thought the Lancel that's been put before me is not mm -hmm. the book's Lancel, who has long grey falling out hair, is thin as a stick, and is um, essentially sort of, you know, literally was got one foot in the coffin, as, as is mentioned in the books. Um, he's not that. They didn't write him like that in this show. He was not. He had to come back, and he had to be... He had to be lost straight away lost there wasn't a devolution there was he's gone most people think he's dead this other entity this ghost of christmas past suddenly comes back mm. i can't actually remember or think of a television show that has been in this situation mm -hmm. uh, where you have this incredible set of books written by this genius and you have this incredible television series by these geniuses and there's this excitement over, will the book come out before the TV? Do, you know, I can't remember a TV show like that. And that is the magic of this program. That is the program <coughs> that these boys have created, these boys and girls, excuse me, have created. And it has been such a privilege to be a part of it. I think Game of Thrones is a game changer for television. I really do. I think we're entering a golden age of television with all the new streaming platforms, the way technology is going, the way social media is going. And I have never been so excited to be an actor in television than I am right now. 
I think we're entering a golden age, and I think Game of Thrones has set a seriously high benchmark. Hi, sorry, Kareem again from the Metro. Um, <coughs> if you guys could have played any other character in the show, who would have it been and why? You've answered this question before very well. You go first. <coughs> well, I mean, no, what I was going to say, if, if I were other than who I am, are you? <laughs> I think that's such a good answer. It just opens all doors. Because a dragon. I'd I, a dragon. I, 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 I mean, both from the books and, and from the series, you know, it, it's a great character. And uh, I've just always been intrigued by that character and sort of like followed it, you know. Um, but, you know, being who I am, uh, I did actually read for Tywin, but I wouldn't want to compete against Charles. Um, and I did read for Mormont, funnily enough. Um, but I was very happy being Barrison. Um, I don't know who else I might like to be. That's, that's enough to be getting out of. I would have, it was the same for me, the audition process for season one, you know, you get seen for maybe one, maybe two, maybe three roles in the initial uh, castings. I read for Jory Cassell, uh, Ned Stark's right-hand man, who Nikolai very kindly finished off very quickly, <laughs> and I got Meryl. Uh, so I wasn't in it for half of one season, I was in it for five seasons. Uh, Jamie Seaves, who played Jory Cassell, was perfect as Jory Cassell. He was absolutely perfect. He nailed it. And he did a much better job than I would have done if I'd been casting that. The casting, in my opinion, uh, just speaking as a fan of the show, is so good that when you see somebody in a role, you couldn't think of anybody else doing it. You couldn't think of anybody else playing that role. Uh, so I, I was very happy with Sir Merrin, and I wouldn't have wanted to be anybody else because they would have done it better. <laughs> I, I auditioned for Joffrey. I wouldn't want him to play him. I, I was so happy. I was so no, not because of his, uh, the nature of his character. It would have been fun to do, but um, I would not be as as satisfied as I am had I not played Lancel because it was a very important um, it was a very important story for me to be able to go from a young and rather um, rather innocent and you know in some ways fairly fairly shortly um, exposed Lannister to a member of the of the Faith Militant and that mature that maturity let's not forget, is also really part of why the character Lancel is who he is. It's not just religion and, and fanaticism. He's older. He's literally older. I, 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 it, was, it was small things. I weighed about 40 pounds more than I did playing Lancel the, the Sparrow than I did playing Lancel the Squire or Lancel the Knight. He's bigger and he's, he's, he's taller, he's older. It's, a, it's why, why most of the people who were downstairs, when they, um, when they saw, saw photos of me as Lancel in Season 2 with gold locks and Lancel in Season 5, they go... Was it the same person? They actually thought you were recast. They were, they, Some they, people they, thought you were they, recast. Most people thought, <laughs> most people thought I was recast. Um, and, I mean, it's... So, in that... I mean, by the way, I took great pleasure in that. I was, I was like, ugh. Because I was able to... I was, I was allowed to tweet and, and put out on a social media the fact that Lancel is, is coming back. I was allowed to, but I, I didn't until... Well, basically, I was at the premiere and it was common knowledge. Um, because I did not want to. I wanted the... The, the walk up to Cersei to be as as confusing and revelatory as it was. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely would have wanted to play Lancer the whole time. I'm very lucky in that sense. And well, we are at uh, end of our conference. Oh, I was enjoying that. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much today. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It's a terrific suit, by the way. This is a terrific get up. <laughs>